In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Hello, everyone. So we're here today um, as we approach the Feast of the Circumcision of our Lord. It's one of the seven minor feasts on Thursday, and today's Tuesday. And so also on that day um, is the day that we commemorate the patron of our church, which is the, the commemoration of St. Basil the Great. And uh, today we're going to learn about why he's called the Great, because only a few saints in church history have that title. And uh, he's one of the few. So, um, and it's definitely worthy of him when you really look at uh, his life and what he's accomplished and what he's left us. So I really feel uh, like, you know, in one hour, there's no way I'm going to do him justice. Um, and, I, and I ask for everyone's forgiveness and I ask for St. Basil's forgiveness. And and because uh, I know I'm going to fall short in just one hour. I was telling some people before the meeting today that, I was able to find some other talks um, that were like six or seven hours of discussion, and that probably still isn't enough. Uh, we have a lot of his writings, a lot of his history, a uh, lot to talk about. So today we'll just kind of give a brief overview of his life and his works. And um, you know, if you have any other questions or if you want links to additional information, please don't hesitate to reach out and I'll, I'll be happy to provide that for you. So today we'll hopefully cover his life as a layman, as a priest, and as a bishop, and his impact that we feel, um, uh, you know, almost 1,700 years later. But just a brief overview, and let's just talk a little bit about the importance of studying church history and the lives of the saints. You know, why should we study that? Why should we read it, um, especially if it's happened so long ago, right? Or we our sense of time that 1700 years is a long time because this happened in the fourth century and we're now in the 21st century. So um, we have to recognize how history has impacted us, right? We're here today and part of who we are uh, and where we are has to do with many generations before us and how it's impacted us and how God has moved the pieces in the fabric of our history that led up to uh, you know, how we're here today on Zoom and on YouTube listening to, to this talk. Um, it also adds, the history that has come before us adds to who we are as well. Um, you know, we all, of course, define our personalities and our actions on our own, no matter what our history is. But nevertheless, certain influences have impacted us uh, that, uh, from people who have gone before us. And when we see that, we recognize our place in history so that we're part of this story that's unfolding, the story of humanity. Um, and it links us, especially the Christian history that we review together, it links us to those lives of the saints that have gone before us. We're part of that story. We're part of like, if you can say this, you know, we're like, it's like the book of Acts that um, it has finished, but we're, it hasn't really finished because we're still continuing. We're still living in the period of grace of the Holy Spirit uh, that's active in our life and active in uh, glorifying the Holy Trinity. So we're part of that link with all the saints. And so the history of the saints is nothing apart than our own history and our own life. We're linked to it. Uh, so we recognize how history can also pave the road ahead. So we read about what's happened before us. We learn about how it's impacted today. And, we, and it paves the road moving forward uh, on how, you know, what steps we take in the future. We learn from the successes and the failures of those who have gone before us, and we hopefully make the right decisions moving forward. So there's a lot to be gained from studying history. We also recognize that we have an impact on history. You know, we're part of this story, and we have an impact on, our, on this story. Human history isn't that long. It's what I think recorded history is about 10,000 years or so is what some of the scholars are saying. Um, you know, that's, that's not really too long ago when you really look at how many generations. Um, and our, our life is not like an invisible dot. If you put it to scale on a line, you'll definitely see your life there visible. 
And what we do today, what we do in our lives today, ripples in the future, many generations moving forward. Um, we, what we do today impacts our children and then they take it and then they move on and they impact their children as well. Even after we're gone, those ripples remain. It's like when you throw a stone in a pond, that stone disappears really quickly, but those ripples remain long after the stone has disappeared. We are like the, that little stone that's been thrown in this little pond of life and we're causing these ripples to go longer than we will be here on earth. And whatever we do, good or bad, will ripple into the next generations that will follow us. So when we look at some of the theological fathers, right? Some of the fathers who have defined Christology and Trinitarian theology, the, the, the main beliefs that we have, that's the foundation of the Christian faith. Uh, the ones that have expounded on the, the teachings of the apostles and what the, our Lord Jesus Christ taught and also from the Old Testament. Um, these are only a handful of really major milestone saints, right? Many foundational saints. Um, and they're basically six as listed in the absolution of the servants uh, during the liturgy. Um, those are St. Athanasius, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, St. Cyril of Alexandria, and St. Severus of Antioch. In our Coptic church, those are the six uh, saints that if you're ever going to discuss theology or, or call yourself a theologian, you're definitely testing yourself against these six. Um, the first five are common in all of the Orthodox and Catholic churches. Um, the Eastern Church would add St. Gregory of Nyssa, and the Western Church would add, uh, probably add St. Augustine to this list as well. Uh, but those are, the, are, are like main people that we refer back to. And of this list, um, you know, St. Basil and St. Gregory, we're going to talk a lot about these two today because they were best friends uh, growing up. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And the Eastern Church adds St. Gregory of Nyssa, which is the brother of St. Basil. So, you know, those, those three between St. Gregory, St. Basil, and St. Gregory of Nyssa, they are called the Cappadocian Fathers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Don't be alarmed by this graph. This is something I usually put to help me kind of view in context when the church fathers lived and when, when they were bishops. And so I put this together. And so you can see here, St. Basil lived from approximately 329 to um, when he passed away at 379. Um, and so he was bishop for a period of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years or so approximately. And we can see when you lay it on a graph like this that he had overlap of about five years with St. Athanasius the Great, right? So he was a bishop of Caesarea while St. Athanasius was the patriarch and bishop of Alexandria. And so with that overlap, you, you kind of get a perspective of when the church fathers lived and uh, who impacted what. And, and these numbers in here are their ages. So uh, he was 42 when he became a bishop and he passed away around somewhere between 49 to 51 years old. He's called a Cappadocian father. So the area of Cappadocia is, is like central to, um, uh, Turkey. It's about the size of uh, Texas, roughly speaking. Um, two generations before, have you ever wondered why there are a lot of uh, Gregories that we talk about? Well, we'll talk about that today. Why are there so many Gregories in our commemoration of the saints or when we talk about uh, especially the Cappadocian fathers? Well, it all began many generations earlier. We talk about the stone that's thrown into the pond and that has ripples into future generations. St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, you, you, if you might remember him from the uh, commemoration of the saints um, and during the liturgy. And so St. Gregory the Matargos, or the Wonder Worker, um, he learned in the school of Alexandria and he was a student of none other than Origen. So he learned under Origen and then he, um, uh, you know, at the school of Alexandria, went to this area of Cappadocia with only Legend has it that there were only like 10 Christians. So he went for pastoral reasons to serve those 10 Christians. And um, by the time he passed away, that whole area was converted to Christianity. The whole area, the size of, say, Texas, is, has been converted by one man named Gregory the Wonder Worker. So 
he converted a whole bunch of people. And then two to three generations later, we have these great saints, St. Basil, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and many other saints that have happened, uh, that happen to have grown in this uh, area, all from the labors of St. Gregory the Wonder Worker just a few generations before. Um, so like we said, St. Basil is one of the three Cappadocian fathers, just a title that's been given by recent scholars. Uh, so St. Basil the Great of Caesarea, St. Gregory the Theologian of a city called Nazanzus, and St. Gregory of Nyssa, who is also the brother of St. Basil. But let's, whenever we talk about a church father, it's healthy to know the environment that they lived in. So uh, a few decades before St. Basil, um, Emperor Constantine ended the era of the persecutions, and he was the undisputed emperor of the biggest empire the Roman Sea has ever seen. Uh, and you can see how big it spanned, right, all over that area. And the area we're focusing on today is Asia Minor, and Cappadocia is within, within that area. Um, so Saint um, Emperor Constantine issued what's called the Edict of Milan. It's a letter or an edict that basically legalized Christianity. And that, uh, so that was a, uh, a new era for the church. Sorry. Can you please push me? Uh, Thank you. And so the Edict of Milan was this letter that Emperor Constantine issued, and it legalized Christianity. And so this was a new era of the church. It helped the church grow very quickly. Uh, but at the same time, and you can see here by the fourth century, Christianity was all through Egypt. Um, paganism was pretty much uh, on its last breath. And Christianity was definitely in the, this, um, the area of uh, Asia Minor, all throughout Europe, North Africa, and of course, Egypt as well. And it reached all the way to Britain as well too. Um, but this created new challenges, right? No more persecutions. There was a flood of insincere converts that entered into the church imperial intrusion in the church, you know, that whole separation of church and state. Uh, there was a big problem now with the emperor and his uh, imperials now like um, messing around with church functions and meddling in church affairs. Uh, secularism was huge because of this. And the, the thing that marked the fourth century were these heresies, 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 especially the Arian heresy and morph, um, like morphs of that heresy, mutations of that uh, Arian heresy. And we can see here that St. John Chrysostom says that the mother of all heresy is the desire to rule. And that's what happened, right? That that lust for power entered into the church because of these, now we're like the church is friends with the empire and it caused a new challenge for the church. St. Athanasius was one of the main ones who battled this and he battled it with monasticism and he battled the heresies, of course, with his writings as well. Because of all the liberty and favors given to the church, uh, because of Emperor Constantine, the close relationship with the church and the empire, the large number of hasty and immature conversions, the Arian heresies, which, which basically marked the fourth century. Paganism was still aggressive, but on a major decline, and early monasticism began to uh, start. So St. Athanasius was the, uh, like the star of the fourth century, right? But also St. Basil was like near the tail end of the fourth century. He kind of like took the baton from St. Athanasius and ran with it. Um, so those two stood really, really powerfully stood out in the fourth century. So going now to drilling down to St. Basil and his family. Um, his family was amazing. Uh, when you look at his family, we have multiple saints that are just coming out of his family. Um, we have St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, who, like I said, converted many. Um, the grandfather of St. Basil was a martyr, was a Christian martyr. Uh, but he had St. Macrina, who eventually married and had um, Saint ba another St. Basil, uh, the father of St. Basil, so St. Basil Sr. Um, and then St. Basil and St. Amelia, those two had 10 children, 10 children. And so... Um, of those 10 children, one of them died in infancy, so that was le left nine. And um, another one died in the, his 20s or so, and he was a saint. But of the of St. Amelia and St. Basil the Senior, 
four of the nine remaining children, I'm sorry, five of the nine remaining children became saints in the church. You had Saint Macrina, which is depicted here in this icon with um, Saint Basil the Great, her brother, uh, Saint Nectarius, which is not shown here, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, which is shown, and Saint Peter Sebastian is shown here. So Saint Macrina and her and three of her brothers were bishops. So a uh, pretty powerful uh, example of how a family, if they raise their children right, can really become like these legends, right? So uh, something, they were doing something right uh, with their children. And then the other one too uh, was a saint, but he died in his 20s, but he was a very righteous and, and saintly life. Uh, we won't really get into him too much, uh, Saint Nacritius, um, but he died in his 20s, but he's also a saint as well. Okay, so the family, uh, if you guys can picture this as we progress here, uh, St. Macrina the Elder with St. Macrina the Younger, you know, two generate like the grandmother, and St. Basil the Elder and St. Basil the Great. So don't mix those two names up as we talk. So his grandmother, Macrina the Elder, was instructed by the disciple of St. Gregory the Wonderworker. So they reached back all the way to St. Gregory the Wonderworker, who is, of course, a student of a region who, from the School of Alexandria in Egypt. His father died early, so uh, the nine children, because remember, one died in infancy, um, were under the care of his mother, Emilia, should have capitalized that, and his grandmother, Macrina, the elder, right? And so the grandfather was a martyr, and so his mother, Emilia, was orphaned, was like an orphan daughter. Uh, after her, her father was martyred. Uncle, his uncle Gregory, another Gregory, was a bishop as well. I think I list him here. Yeah, he's right there. Two of the younger brothers, St. Peter of Sebastian and St. Gregory of Nyssa, were both bishops. St. Gregory of Nyssa was a very prolific writer and one of the three, uh, considered one of the three Cappadocian fathers. The Eastern Orthodox Church value him a little bit more. We struggle a little bit with some of his region uh, teaching specifically uh, about the universal salvation, but he's a great and wonderful writer and there's a lot to be benefited from St. Gregory the Um Let's talk a little bit about St. Macrina because she does have a huge impact on St. Basil. Her life was written by her brother, Gregory of Nyssa. Her early life was dedicating to uh, study scripture. And, and her brother um, says that this, the, the Psalms were her constant companion, like a good fellow traveler that never deserted her. So she was always saying the Psalms. And so David the Psalmist was always with her. Um, she was committed to being unmarried and to help her mother. They tried to marry her once and her fiance passed away. So she said, well, that's a sign from God. I'm just gonna stick to uh, being celibate. So she dedicated her life uh, to just remaining um, uh, celibate. Um, and, and, her and her mother really benefited from that. Of course, she, you know, cause her, her father passed away at an early age and so, it was left really with um, her mother, Amelia, and St. Macrina raising the other uh, brothers and sisters, uh, the other eight children. So uh, it says here, so that her mother would often say that she had carried the rest of her children in her womb for a definite time, but that Macrina she bore always, since in a sense, she ever carried her about. So she said, yeah, I carried the children in my womb for nine months, but St. Macrina really helped raise the children. And so she had a huge impact on, on, her, on her brothers and sisters. One of the four brothers passed away in his 20s, as we talked about, and Macrina supported her mother during this really, really difficult time, uh, gave her mother inspiration. Her mother was, you know, really about to lose it, uh, lose her, um, you, know, you know, it's a very difficult thing to bear, of course. And, and so her mother uh, was supported by St. Macrina, who gave her support and, you know, again, gave her uplifting words and by her mode of life, showed a lot of courage and, and inspired her mother to stand back up on her feet after that. And as the siblings moved out, their home, um, Macrina and her mom turned the home into like a little convent. And it was like the first convent in that area. 
Um, but these women, Macrina and her mother, fell short of the angelic and immaterial nature only in so far as they appeared in bodily form. So besides the fact that they had a physical body, they were like angels uh, praying in their, in their house. And they had like a beautiful, um, like, uh, like a little convent. And, and so uh, St. Peter Sebastia, the one of the, the, youngest of the, the youngest of the family, who also became a bishop, also stayed with them and lived with them for a little bit um, because he liked that lifestyle as well. So after the passing of her mother, after St. Amelia passed away and also St. Basil passed away, uh, she allows many to join the convent, you know, the, her home. And it really became a bigger convent with sisters that dwelt there. Um, and many sisters from different backgrounds were attracted to that place. And St. Macrena led them to a, a very uh, high spiritual order of life. And uh, it's really remarkable what she accomplished um, with all the hardships that she went through. So his father, um, St. Basil's father, uh, Basil the Elder, renowned lawyer and rhetorician and member of the Roman aristocracy. So he had like a big, um, like a big role in government, right? And he was one of, um, one of his sons died in in infancy, but he also died early as well. So le leaving the children uh, to be managed and taken care of by St. Macrina and her mother. She was the oldest of the nine, and St. Basil was the oldest of the sons um, that were there. Uh, she had a huge spiritual and theological influence uh, from her grandmother um, and, her, and uh, her mother and, and sister, I'm sorry. So the three people that influenced St. Basil greatly were his grandmother, his mother, and his sister. They had a huge impact on St. Basil. So as St. Basil grew up, they sent him to Constantinople to study uh, philosophy. And then, um, I'm sorry, he went to Athens first and then to Constantinople. And while there, he was acquainted with two very important people at the School of Athens in Greece. Um, little did they know that these two people that he met would eventually, uh, you know, one become a, a very big enemy and then another one a very close friend. We'll talk about the first one, Julian. Uh, he later became emperor. So, you know, Providence willed it that Julian and St. Basil and St. Gregory the theologian went to school together. And Julian, who would later become emperor, right? So the school of Athens impacted him in a negative uh, aspect, right? You know, and it led him to actually renounce Christianity. And he earned the title Julian the Apostate, because he left Christianity, he tried to undermine Christianity. Uh, Basil struggles a lot with Julian later, but thankfully St. Basil was much firmer in his faith so as not to be affected by this school that's in Athens that messed, uh, that kind of hurt Julian a little bit. Julian left away wounded and I don't think he ever recovered. The other person that St. Basil met was St. Gregory the Theologian, um, one of the three Cappadocian fathers. Uh, the Coptic Church uses uh, his liturgy. He's one of the, the three liturgies we use. Uh, so St. Gregory the Theologian authored one of them. Um, and he would become St. Basil's lifelong friend. And, but that friendship had its ups and downs, as we'll talk about later. So he returns from Athens, and he's educated now. He knows some theology. He comes back, and he's frustrated that no one around uh, really uh, understood or had knowledge um, like he did. And so his brother, St. Gregory of Nyssa, writes that St. Basil was puffed up beyond measure with pride of oratory, of oratory and looked down upon the local dignitaries, excelling in his own estimation all the men of leading position. Nevertheless, this is where St. Macrina comes in as his older sister, right? Nevertheless, St. Macrina took him by the hand and with such speed did she draw him also toward the mark of philosophy that he forsook the glories of this world and despised fame gained by speaking and deserted it for this busy life where one toils with one's hands. So he came back all puffed up. He was ready to become a lawyer. St. Macrina interceded really quick, took him by the hand as St. Gregory, the brother says, and kind of, I can just only imagine the discussion she did to humble him and to remind him of the true excellencies in life that, you know, that 
he might have missed. He might, it might have missed the mark if it wasn't for his big sister. And so immediately after this, no matter who knows what kind of discussion this had or discussions that St. Macrina had, but he goes from being so puffed up to wanting to um, abandon all of his uh, money and to look into monasticism and live a uh, monastic life, okay? So what is like a quick turnaround just from the discussion with St. Macrina? So St. Basil then begins to look around for monasticism. He's starting to considering it. He was ordained as a reader in the church and then goes off to study, you know, monasticism. Keep in mind, monasticism just started with St. Anthony the Great just a few decades earlier. And St. Athanasius writes the life of St. Anthony and it's starting to gain popularity, but it hasn't really made its way as a formal order of life in the area of Cappadocia and Asia Minor. Not yet. So then he goes around the world to monastic communities that were already in place. Of course, he travels to Egypt to uh, learn from those monastic elites called the Desert Fathers. And, you know, we have many books about the Desert Fathers. I was just reading some today. There's two volumes by a person named Wallace Budge. Um, should be in every library. But he goes and he learns from these uh, desert fathers. He also goes to Syria and Palestine where there were great monasteries there as well. And he returns home, renounces his considerable inheritance and establishes a monastery next to his home in uh, the northeast part of the Cappadocia area. Uh, it's a, a city called Anasi. We'll see it on a map later. Uh, he practiced a strict ascetic rule of life. Some say that strictness actually uh, hurt his physical, uh, like his, it actually hurt him physically. And, um, but he continued in it and was credited with started monasticism in this whole area called Asia Minor in the present day Turkey, um, in a form similar to St. Pachomius, uh, St. Pachomius's rule in Egypt. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, this is, we'll see some pictures, uh, of what this area looks like. So this is like near his home and where the monastery was as well. You can see very hilly and lush and very picturesque, right? Very, really beautiful. Um, he describes the location of this, uh, what came to be the first monastery in the area as uh, at a point of convergence between two rivers. So it could have looked like this. These actual pictures are in uh, an area called Pontus. Um, either here or maybe in a place like this where they start a monastery. Um, so it was really picturesque and, and like, you know, must have had profound, uh, caused profound feelings as they contemplated uh, scriptures and the spiritual life in that area. But a stark difference, of course, from the deserts of Egypt, from the desert fathers. And here's some other monasteries that um, uh, eventually uh, took root in Pontus. This one was like carved out of some stone and some rock over there. So this is after St. Basil started his other monasteries popped up such as these. So around this time though, as he's um, looking into monasticism and starting a monastery, uh, Julian, his companion at the University of Athens was now emperor. So Julian, as we talked about, tried to undermine the faith. Uh, he, was, he wanted to kind of return back to uh, pagan philosophy. And so he uh, wrote a, a writing called Against the Galileans, which really is against the apostles. He was attacking the apostles. And we have this writing, by the way, if you're ever interested in reading it. Both St. Gregory the Theologian, the friend of St. Basil, and St. Cyril and Alexa of Alexandria later, uh, in the next century, in the fifth century, um, and in greater detail, he kind of takes a bit like piece by piece and, and kind of dismantles uh, all that Julian was saying. And we have that in writing too. I even put the link here for you. Um, so St. Ba Saint, uh, Gregory and St. Cyril refute all of the writings of Julian um, in great detail. But he was really cruel toward the Cappadocian Christians. Uh, he uh, later on in one of his campaigns against the Persians, um, he ends up getting killed by what is known as a mysterious soldier, right? And so tradition has it that St. Basil was praying to a saint, uh, was asking a saint to, to intercede on this issue. 
and he asked Saint Macarius, uh, Philopatir Macarius. And so Saint Philopatir, the story goes, disappeared from the icon and then came back and he saw, and he looked at Saint Basil looked again and he saw the icon again, but this time this, this spear had some blood on it. So you might have seen this famous icon here um, of Saint Philopatir. So here's Saint Basil and here is Julian the apostate because tradition, uh, some traditions have it that Saint Philopatir is the one who actually interceded uh, like the angels in the Old Testament, right? And, and uh, dealt that fatal blow to uh, end the persecution against the Christians by Julian the apostate. I know this uh, icon looks familiar to many people, uh, Saint Macarius of the Two Swords. So shortly after this, um, upon the death of Julian, there's another emperor that takes his place called Valens. He becomes emperor. So he was supposedly Christian, but often sided with the Arian heresy. So he wasn't like Christian, like the Orthodox Christians or, or the Catholics or Protestant. They had like this heresy called the Arian um, heresy, which uh, took root, you know, earlier that century uh, with Arian with Arius, um, but it was still continuing even after Arius uh, died and it morphed into different versions of, of this heresy. But St. Basil is now ordained a priest during this time as well, so now he's a priest. And as he becomes a priest, he now enters into more of a public life. He, he is helping his bishop Eusebius of Caesarea in church administration. He's now starting to wake up to the theological challenges of the time. And he combats these heresies openly with vigor and profound writings that we still have. And he, he does many pastoral works of charity during this time as a priest as well. Um, and then he is ordained as a uh, archbishop in 369. Um, shortly after, his spiritual father, uh, Eusebius, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Eusebius of Caesarea passes away in his arms in 370. And so, um, I'm sorry, I'll back up. Before his ordination, his mother passed away in 369, so he wasn't ordained, but his mom passed away, so it was a difficult time, and then his like spiritual father, the Archbishop uh, of Caesarea, he passes away the following year in 370 in the arms of St. Basil, and so immediately after that, St. Basil was elected to replace him in that same year as the Archbishop of Caesarea, which is the cosmopolitan area, right, it's a big, big role. So St. Basil writes to his friend, uh, St. Gregory the Theologian, uh, to come uh, to the ordination, but he was kind of trying to be a little sneaky. And so this is the first strain on his friendship with St. Gregory. He told him, he tells him that he was really sick. And it's true that he was always sick, right? So that part was probably true that he was sick, but he didn't tell him that he was about to be ordained bishop. And so he asked him to come because he wanted to force uh, St. Gregory the Theologian to be like his auxiliary bishop, his assistant bishop of Caesarea, which is a big honor, but St. Gregory wasn't having it. On his, when he first heard that he was sick, he started leaving, but on the road towards uh, the, the ordination, he finds out from others that what's really happening is St. Basil's being ordained Archbishop of Caesarea, and he's like, well, I'm not having this, and so he turns around and goes back home, and St. Basil was really hurt by this, right? He put a strain by the relationship. But St. Gregory kind of said, hey, you were trying to trick me, man. What's going on? So St. Athanasius, uh, during this time too, after his ordination, St. Athanasius of Alexandria writes a letter congratulating uh, the area for electing such a person like St. Basil. So Arianism was still alive, right? Um, even though the Council of Nicaea condemned it, it was still breathing. Um, it was still a threat. Um, and so just like St. Athanasius was battling it, so was St. Basil. On one occasion, this is a great story. Um, on one occasion, Valens, Emperor Valens sends this Arian bishop called Modestus. And he met St. Basil and began to threaten him, saying, you have to follow this, uh, this teaching. And he, and he threatened him with confiscation of all of his property. He threatened him with exiling. He threatened him with torture. And he even threatened him to kill him, right, with the soldiers, because he came, after all, with the power of the emperor. St. Basil looked at him and responded that none of these things frightened him. He says he had nothing to be confiscated except a few rags and a few books. 
what are you going to take from me? You're going to take my books and you're going to take a few rags that I have on my, on the back, on, on, on my body right now. You're going to banish me and exile me. You can't send me anywhere where God doesn't exist. Are you going to torture me? How can you torture a body that I'm already very ascetic, you know, in my dealings with it? Um, I'm not afraid of any kind of torture. And are you going to threaten me with death? Hey, that could only bring me closer to my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid of death either. And Modestus was really amazed at this powerful response and tells Basil that no one's ever spoken to him like that. And so St. Basil responds saying, perhaps you've never really met a real bishop before, you know, saying that he wasn't a real bishop. And so um, very powerful and strong uh, in, his, uh, in his demeanor. And he, so Modestus goes back to the emperor and says, Look, we can't do anything with them. We can't convince this person. During this time, um, he writes one of his most important books, which is called On the Holy Spirit. Um, the heresy of Arius not only, you know, like uh, minimized the, the divinity of the wisdom of God, the Son of God, but it also minimized the divinity of his Holy Spirit as well. Um, so the Macedonians, which are semi-Aryan, denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So St. Basil, of course, writes on the Holy Spirit. This theology of St. Basil that he championed, and also with his friend St. Gregory and his brother, uh, was used in the Council of Constantinople, even though St. Basil passed away before the Council of Constantinople. This theology lived on into that council, and at that council, you all know that the creed was completed, so the, the last part of the creed that says, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the life giver, etc., that was completed um, at the Council of Constantinople. And, and it, uh, it condemned the heresy of the Macedonians and Arianism. So his friend, St. Basil, uh, St. Gregory the theologian, right? St. Basil, in order to strengthen a regional influence in the area, he sought to ordain pro-Nicene uh, bishops, bishops who would champion the Nicene theology of St. Athanasius. And so he wanted to strengthen the regional influence of the area. So he wanted to ordain St. Gregor of Nyssa, his brother, and St. Gregor of Sebastia in certain locations, and also St. Gregory the theologian, his friend, to a city called Sassima in 372. And according to St. Gregory the theologian, he hated that place. It was a lousy place. It was, um, you know, the very small population, no significance. It wasn't uh, like it wasn't an area that he can focus and, and really, it was like, you know, he couldn't use any of his talents, right, in a place like that. It was like a village kind of. Um, and so St. Gregory hated it, and he was very upset at his friend St. Basil for using his authority to put him in that location. And But he obeys, especially St. Gregory, the theologian's dad, kind of, pushed him a little bit, and he eventually does go there, um, and they eventually made up uh, as well. St. Gregor the Theologian and St. Basil made up, uh, so even uh, saints can conflict with each other, right? Um, so St. You know, Mark and St. Paul, the Apostle in the, in the Book of Acts, right? Uh, we hear about uh, Origen and the Patriarch of Alexandria. We hear about John Chrysostom and uh, Theophilus. We hear about here even two friends, Gregory the Theologian and St. Basil. Pope Shenouda and Pope Carollo, some people say they conflicted once in a while. You know, these are saints, and yet they're still human. Human beings will disagree with each other. They will have arguments. They'll see different paths to uh, maybe the same goal. And they're human beings, and that's totally okay. Because in heaven now, they're not arguing, right? They're in total unity, and they're... And they, love each other and they're praying for us. Uh, but as proof that St. Gregory and St. Basil made up, uh, St. Gregory gave the eulogy um, at the funeral of his friend St. Basil. And we have that eulogy today. It's really beautiful. In it, he says, I, Gregory, who am torn away from our great union and dragging along a life of pain after the separation from him, know not what is to be my end now that I have lost my guidance. I mean, he very endearing um, and loving words to his friend, St. Basil the Great. And, and in this eulogy, that's where he uh, 
gets the title the Great because of his friend Saint Gregor the Theologian calls him Saint Basil the Great. And that name stuck. But you can see the wisdom of Saint Basil. Um, so Saint Basil of Caesarea, this is the uh, part of Asia Minor, the, like you can call it maybe the Eastern part, uh, which is the area of Cappadocia. And here's Italy just for point of reference. And so um, he was here. So he ordained his friend Gregory the Theologian at Sassima. And then uh, later on, St. Gregory moves to Nizanzas. And he, that's why that's one of his titles, St. Gregory Nizanzas or the Theologian. And then he puts his brother Gregory of Nisa here. And he puts his other brother uh, at Sebaste, St. Peter of Sebaste. And then his home, by the way, is right there. And his first monastery is right there. So his wisdom is like, you, you can't pass through Cappadocia without having this wall of Nicene orthodoxy, right? The true Christian uh, belief, the Nicene theology was like this wall that was right in the middle. You couldn't get through this. And so uh, he was really brilliant for pulling that off. But um, St. Gregory just didn't like this little town that, that he was put in there. But I'm sure he got over it. So eventually St. Basil passes, on the way, passes away in the year 379, between the ages of 49 and 51 or so. Uh, St. Gregory says that um, as they were carrying his body at his funeral, tens of thousands of people came from every faith, uh, from every religion, from every race, from every age to pay respects. Uh, he demanded a high respect from everyone around him. Um, the Coptic Church, uh, our Coptic Orthodox Church follows the old calendar, so we commemorate him on January 14th or the 6th of October. Could be January 15th on a leap year, so that's this Thursday, January 14th. Uh, the church also commemorates an, uh, one of St. Basil's miracles on September 23rd. So a little bit about his writings. So he has, thank God, has left us um, a large amount of writings. Um, we have uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are translated in uh, this book here, the Nicene post nicene Fathers. This is in PDF version as well, so anyone who's interested, uh, we can make that available. Um, and he, uh, but there's also other writings that are now just being translated. Um, so one of his big writings, of course, is on the Holy Spirit. That's, that's one of his masterpieces. Um, also against Eunomius, who was an Arian, and it's a very Trinitarian writing, uh, and now it's available in English, so we have that translated as well. Uh, then his other category of writing is exegetic or Bible commentaries. He comments on some of the uh, Bible writings. Uh, his most famous one is, uh, is called the Hexameron. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but um, it is on the six days of creation. So he has a big writing just on the six days of creation. He also has some homilies on the Psalms as well. Then of course he writes uh, ascetic or monastic rules. Like we, we talked about that he started uh, monasticism in this area. So what was called the small eschaton or ascetic and the great eschaton, they're in the form of question and answers um, on how to live the monastic life. And so uh, the small one has 203 and the big one has 376. I'm not sure if all of these have been translated into English or not. Um, he's also got around 40 homilies or so. And these are ser sermons that he's given. For sure he gave more than 40, but these are the 40 that we have right now that have, cover a whole range of topics. We have over 300 letters. Uh, that's a lot of letters that he wrote. Um, uh, really amazing when you think about it, right? Uh, how many letters he wrote with his own hand. And that's, that's just those who, that have survived till this day. One of his famous writings is, um, it's not really his writing, but his compilation that he worked on with his friend, St. Gregor the Theologian, called the Philokalea, which is a, a collection of some of the good writings of a region. So there's some maybe not so good writings of a region, but he collects these good writings of a region and puts them together in what's called the Philokalea. And we put a hyperlink here uh, for those who are interested, you can copy that down. And of course, we all know as Coptic Orthodox Christians, we know that he writes the liturgy, right? And his liturgy is used in our church more than any other liturgy. Um, uh, we use St. Basil's liturgy almost every week, uh, every Sunday. His theology, uh, he's considered a defender of the Nicene Creed, a defender of the Holy Trinity, 
and a defender of the Holy Spirit. I mean, these are three qualities of his writings when it came to theology. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about his another like amazing quality of his life is the pastoral care that he showed during the time. So he wasn't just this theoretical theologian. Uh, he was a very practical um, strategist. He was a very practical and, and loving person. Um, he builds multiple institutions outside of the city of Caesarea, just outside of it. Uh, these institutions were orphanages. He built hospitals. He built hospices, hotels for the poor and the travelers. And so many institutions were built um, that they called this area the new city. And, and it was so organized. And of course, right in the middle was this church. And it was such a beautiful, like, city right that had all these buildings that saint gregory um calls it one of the seven wonders of the world it was really a huge accomplishment that this one man the saint builds the city that is just there to give spiritual because the church was there and physical relief to those in trouble right those who are struggling and um you know it started attracting a lot of attention uh it supports the population, for example, during a great uh, drought and famine that happened in the area. Um, and St. Gregory the Theologian says that St. Basil with his own hands and sometimes with his own money that he inherited that he was giving to the poor. He was handing out uh, food, he was hanging out clothes. Uh, with his own hands, he would go in the middle of people and hand out uh, the things that people needed. Um, he also writes a beautiful homily called On Famine and Drought. Um, it's a really nice thing. It just shows you that life, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic now, but, you know, back then they had famines, they had fires. And you know that these things happen throughout human history and because the church always uh, includes litanies and prayers uh, asking God to deliver us from these things. Um, we have litanies for like the litany uh, that talks about famine and drought and, and, um, and plagues and, and all sorts and fires and drownings. And so we pray that the God delivers, delivers us from all of these things, and he will. So he organized these relief efforts on a scale that was not seen before, on a scale that was not seen before. <clears throat> His creation of the hospital was a model that we use today. Um, and so strictly uh, Christian reasons, he did this. He didn't do this because he's like this philanthropist or anything like that, but he does it because following the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ to, if you really want to be perfect, sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Just like similar to what happened with St. Anthony, the, uh, the first monk. <clears throat> so the hospitals are the models of today. Um, monasticism. So we know that St. Pachomus was one of the first one to write like a rule of how the community, community of monks should function and live. <clears throat> That's why he's called St of the community or at St. Pachomius in Greek, Kononia. And we say St. Pachomius of the Kononia. St. Basil was the first in the East to write such rules, right? In the form of question and answer, like we just read about, the, and it was called the Askitikon, Askitikon, or the ascetic way of life. And um, so uh, St. Benedict was the first one in the West in the sixth century. St. Basil here in the fourth century. Uh, but both of them probably followed from that model of St. Pachomius of the Canonia, because uh, he was the first one to write. But uh, St. Pachomius was more of a soldier, so I think his was a little more strict than St. Basil's was on how people should uh, function in the monastery. I'm going to end it with a few of the miracles, uh, some of the really interesting miracles that um, St. Basil, uh, you know, said is attributed to him. Um, the first one is about, um, is, is covered in, uh, the, in September 23rd in the Coptic Sanitarium. It's about a young man who um, fell in love with this lady and he, and he wasn't getting the attention he wanted. And so he went to a magician to see what that magician could do. So the magician told him to surrender to Satan and to write a contract as it were, right? And saying that he's dedicating his life to Satan. And so, um, the, you know, Satan kindled a lot of lust in that poor young lady, 
And so because of that lust, they ended up getting married. So they married for the wrong reasons, right? So, but after their marriage, she noticed that he didn't pray, he didn't take communion, uh, never made the sign of the cross or anything like that. And so uh, she asked him why, and he told her the story. And, uh, she, you know, she wept and she was um, very sad that he even signed an agreement. Um, so they, they went to St. Basil, and after seeing the young man's desire to repent, St. Basil comforted him and asked him to stay there with him for three days to pray. On the third day, St. Basil visited him and asked him, how's it going? And he says, you know, I'm, I can't stop. The young man says, I can't stop seeing visions of evil spirits and, and how um, you're fighting them on my behalf. Um, and so St. Basil asked him to stay a little bit longer and to remain with him. And after praying and fasting, and after a few days, he came back to visit him again. And the young man said that St. Basil uh, was continuing to fight with these demons, and, and, uh, but St. Basil was victorious. So St. Basil fed him again and prayed with him a little bit more. Um, and then he also prayed as well. So until the 40 days were completed, and then he, the, he saw that, um, that victory was there. And so St. Basil gathered all the priests and the monks to pray in the church. And, um, and they prayed all night. And the next day, um, while, the, while they were singing that chant, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison, uh, they all cried out. And then... Um, until that writing kind of floated down from the sky, landed in the arms of St. Basil, who tore it up in front of everyone. So that uh, miracle is, uh, is um, counted on September 33rd and 23rd in, in the Coptic Cynic Sermon. Uh, this next miracle has to do with St. Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, I like this story. St. Ephraim had a vision about the greatness of who St. Basil was. So that sparked his curiosity, and he asked God about St. Basil and how a large pillar of fire appeared in front of St. Ephraim. And um, that voice told St. Ephraim, 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 even as this pillar of fire, so is the great Basil. So he decided to go to see um, St. Uh, Ephraim dwelt in like the Palestine area. So he travels to Cappadocia, um, and he wanted to see for himself, right? But he didn't know Greek. So he took uh, one of the, um, his deacons uh, or one of the other priests that were with him who knew Greek. So he accompanied him on this little uh, trip. So when arriving, it was the Feast of the Theophany. So there was a liturgy going on and uh, he walked into the church and they kind of stayed in the back of the church. Um, but he observed St. Basil, like, because it was Epiphany, uh, clothed in um, like splendid, costly vestments, celebrating the, the sacred liturgy with great boldness, as it were. Uh, and St. Ephraim then reproached uh, himself and said, uh, you know, in vain have we labored, brother, because this man, though he's found in such glory, is not as I saw. He thought St. Basil, he misjudged St. Basil as somebody who was just pompous, right? And like, you know, full of glory, but he was in this cathedral praying a liturgy, but he misinterpreted. So St. Basil was clairvoyant enough to know uh, what had happened. So he perceived this and asked one of his deacons to go to the back of the church and, and bring St. Ephraim to the altar. St. Ephraim told the deacon um, through the interpreter, You're, you must be mistaken. We're strangers in this area and unknown. How does the archbishop know us? Uh, please go back and say uh, that he doesn't really know us. And then St. Basil told the deacon a second time, go and say to them, Lord Ephraim, Come to the altar because the archbishop is calling you. So Saint, when the deacon came and told St. Ephraim that, he bowed down and he like, you know, prostrated himself and um, was very humbled and obeyed and went and, into the area. And so after the liturgy uh, near the altar, he spoke to St. Basil and St. Basil said, why have you come to see me as a, a sinner? And uh, he asked St. Basil uh, for a favor. And St. Basil said, what is it? He said, um, if it would be, you know, through your prayers that I should learn Greek. I know if you pray for me, I will learn Greek. And so he says, uh, your request, Holy Father, is beyond my power. But let's both pray. And as you have asked in faith, may it be done to you. So they prayed. And immediately after the prayer, uh, St. Ephraim was able to speak and to understand Greek uh, fluently. He was able to speak to them in Greek. And so very uh, interesting story that happened there. Finally, the story when the Arians took over the church in Nicaea, 
uh, Emperor Valens allowed St. Basil to go there, but as long as he's equal to both parties in his judgment. So St. Basil, when vi was visiting, um, he brought the Arians and, the, and the, Ortho the other Orthodox Christians to the church and said, um, because they were arguing about who owns this cathedral, the Arian heresies or like the, um, the Orthodox. So St. Basil says, okay, we're, here's how we're going to resolve this. Go ahead and lock the door and put a seal on it. Okay, so no one is able to open it. Um, and you go pray, you Arians, go pray for three days and three nights and then return. If the door is open because of your prayers, then you'll be able to keep the church for yourself. But if the doors do not open, then we shall pray for only one day and night and then return. And if the doors open for us, then we'll keep the building. And if they don't open for us, you can have the building. So it seemed like a win-win situation for the Arians, right? So they go away, they pray for three days, they come back, it doesn't work. They go one more day, he gives them another day, they come back a fourth day and the doors do not open. So St. Basil says, all right. So he goes and he prays with the saints, right? With the other uh, Christians and um, they come back and there's an earthquake that rattles the lock, breaks the lock and the doors like fly open in front of everyone. And so, uh, because of this, they were able to take the church. He goes inside and they pray the liturgy together. So a uh, very powerful story there. Um, just a couple more thoughts on his liturgy. Within 50 years after his passing, um, the liturgy with his name is used. And um, according to Leontius, uh, via Theodore Mesopotia, um, um, 50 years later, everyone's using St. Basil's liturgy. Two of the three liturgies used in the Coptic Orthodox Church are those of St. Basil, St. Gregory, his friend, um, and St. Basil is the most used. And the third is that of St. Mark, the apostle, which was affirmed by St. Cyril of Alexandria, it carries the name of St. Cyril. So that's it. Um, may may St. Basil pray to the Lord on our behalf, uh, O teacher of the Holy Faith, St. Basil the Great, that he may forgive us our sins. And we ask St. Basil to uh, remember us in, in heaven. And, and so um, we can uh, see him one day. Uh, these are some of the uh, resources you can have. Uh, if you get some of these books, these are great books. And uh, are there any questions at all? And may his prayers be with us all. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray through the intercessions of our Holy Mother. St. Mary and St. Basil the Great, our Father who art in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Depart in peace, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Abuna. Thank Thanks, Abuna. Thank you, Abuna. Have a great night. Thank you, Abuna.